I'm Dr. Lisa Fox, the Divergent DVM, and this is episode two of the Divergent DVM series on the Barefoot Holistic Vet. If you want to see this whole video, make sure you go to my YouTube page and hit subscribe, and uh, you can see the whole video there. So today, uh, yesterday we kind of talked about what, or the episode one, we talked about how I fed my goats and how I included herbals in my goat feed. And today we're going to talk a little bit more about some other food for some other animals, namely dry food for cats and dogs and why I, as a holistic vet, am completely against it. So in order to give you kind of what dry food is and how it started, I'm going to give you a little history. So in around 1860, uh, a gentleman named James Pratt, who was a electrician, moved from Ohio to the United Kingdom to sell lightning rods. Okay. So, you know, this is where we're starting with the pet food industry is an electrician who's selling lightning rods. So when he was in the UK, he noticed that on the docks that there were stray dogs that were coming around and they were eating up all of the leftover hardtack. Now hardtack is a biscuit that sailors used to use that was shelf stable. And so they use these as um, a nutrition supplement. Think of them as like the granola bars of today or the cereal bars of today. Uh, so they were hardtack biscuits. They um, were nutritious for sailors um, in hard times. And he noticed these dogs eating these, right? So he got this genius idea that he was going to start a dog food company based on that. So he formulated and started selling meat fibrin dog cakes. Yeah, those sound lovely. And he used prairie beef which he never, he called it prairie meat, but he never really said what was in the meat. Um, so it was ground wheat, it was meat, pretty much the same thing that's in our dry pet food today, um, except we didn't really know what was in his as much as we know what's in ours today. Uh, so this was all based on that hard tack. So he started getting a lot of uh, rich English gentlemen, um, the American Kennel Club, all of that to buy his hard tack and stop feeding the table scraps and the meats and the veggies and everything that they were feeding their dogs at that time. So this lasted until about the 1900s. In the 1900s, it became a big thing to do canned pet food. Um, there was a lot of horses actually raised for this to slaughter for the meat industry for canned dog food. Uh, it was labeled as lean red meat. And then if you looked at the bottom of the can, it did say horse meat. So it did say where it was coming from. And this was called Ken L rations. So K-E-N dash L rations, a canned pet food. Now, World War II hit, and in World War II, we had a tin shortage and a meat shortage. So we couldn't have the canned pet food or the canned horse meat, and around this time, people were thinking, hey, we should probably not be raising horses for meat in the United States, which, to each his own, but that was a thing that was happening. And so, because we had a tin shortage and a meat shortage, and we weren't as, you know, into horse meat for animal food... Uh, two companies kind of came out to start working on this problem. So General Mills actually bought out Sprat. So they bought out the meat fibrin dog cakes. And Purina, who had already been making breakfast cereals, started working with their machines and doing an extrusion process of, um, you know, this dough-like consistency of meat and veggies and everything to try to figure out a more palatable dry dog food that was shelf stable. And so all of this happened because of World War II and um, we needed some shelf stable food that we couldn't send in, in cans uh, to send over with um, any of our military animals. And so those two companies kind of started this whole thing. And by about 1964, this whole uh, field took off. 
And so what they were doing is they were using the serial extruder machines. So pretty much the same things that makes your breakfast cereal. Um, and they were taking, instead of the sugary breakfast cereal kind of um, materials, they were using meats and vegetables. And, you know, they were thinking that it's all balanced because we have all these meats and vegetables in it. But during the extrusion process, what happens is it gets ground to a pulp, extruded through a machine, um, heated and steamed to a high temperature to cook it, and then it gets dried out to remove all of the moisture. And then they realize that that process actually took a lot of the vitamins and minerals out. So now we're going to coat it with a fat, um, like an oil spray, to try to get some of those nutrients and minerals back in there. And that is going to increase the palatability for these animals that, you know, are now by this point, um, pretty much kibble crack addicts is what I call them. Um, and this is the reasoning that this is all bad. So any one of our animals, any one of our, our dogs or cats, um, when left to fend for themselves or in the wild, obviously nowadays, none of them would make it by themselves in the wild. Um, but they were meant to be eating small rodents, uh, such as, you know, voles and mice and even rabbits, um, just small, uh, kind of, uh, game like animals. And so if you think about that, I mean, we, we all know that cats would eat a mouse, you know, that's kind of a, that's a common thing. So if we think about a mouse, um, there's a certain amount of calories in a mouse. So a cat needs, I want to say approximately five mice a day to form a full diet. Now, mice are uh, herbivores, so they're going to be eating grains, and they're going to be eating grasses, and they're going to be eating um, seeds and different things like that. So when the cat eats the mouse, they're eating all of the parts. Usually they leave the head behind. I don't know why. Sometimes they will eat the head, but they're eating mostly they're eating the bones, they're eating the meat, they're eating the internal organs. Hmm. So they're not grain-free. So grain-free diets are a fad, and they're actually leading to more detrimental issues than we thought in the past. They're actually leading to a lot of heart issues. It's because even a carnivore, an obligate carnivore like a cat, is supposed to have some form of grains, some form of taurine, and the minerals and compounds that come from grains. But they're supposed to have them in an already pre-digested format. They're supposed to be eating the internal organs of that prey species. So those are already digested grains. So our cats or obligate carnivores can eat those grains because they're already pre-digested. Same with dogs. They're eating the internal organs of these species. A lot of them are, um, they're looking for carcasses. They're looking for stuff that's already a little bit um, uh, already decomposing a little bit. So decomposing tissues, um, they're going to have, they're going to have a little bit more, um, of the probiotic nature, the bacterial nature. So that's actually good for their intestines. Now I'm not saying that all animals need to be on raw. They don't because in our day and age, you have to have a balanced diet. For your animal and a lot of people that are just feeding raw food are not feeding the appropriate balanced ratio of the raw food so you need a calcium phosphorus ratio you need vitamins and minerals and you need um, not just the meat so you're not just feeding chicken breast you're feeding bones appropriately you're feeding tendons appropriately cartilage appropriately you're feeding internal organs appropriately oh hi Orky Eddie well, Orchietti likes cereal too, so he can have some. But, um, so you're feeding all of the ingredients that would be obtained as a prey species would be obtained. And the other thing that we're seeing, that I'm seeing as a holistic vet, is dry food and canned food. So dry food is about 12% moisture level. So, I mean, think about, think about feeding dry cereal to your kid all day long and only adding some water. We're not getting that biological moisture that we need, right? 
So the biological moisture that I'm talking about, a mouse is about 70% moisture. We're made up of about 70% water or moisture. So what I'm seeing is a lot of these problems in animals are stemming from the dryness. We've got dry itch going on. We've got kidney issues. We've got liver issues. We've got tendons not being moisturized. So we've got ACL tears, um, intervertebral disc disease. We've got dry eye. We've got um, low grade dermatitis issues. We've got um, dreaming at night is actually one of those. Uh, some GI signs are all from this dryness issue. And so what I'm getting at is because we've been feeding this dry food for so long, we're actually causing issues and causing clinical uh, dehydration in our patients and in our clients. And, and it's, not, it's not acceptable. So as a human race, we're trying to go off of more processed foods and go towards more whole foods, right? That's what we need to be doing with our animals. Now, I'm not saying that you need to just start cooking from some random recipe on the web, on a website because you need to have a balanced ratio. So for me, variety is the key for our animals. So if I give you a few recipes, know that they're balanced. And those recipes you can switch out week to week. So we're getting in different vegetables, different um you know, different meats, different vitamins and minerals, and we're going to be adding supplements as well. So we know that those are balanced diets. The other thing is that if we increase this moisture level with our patients, we're going to be decreasing the amount of dry itch dermatitis. We're going to be increasing, decreasing the amount of um, kidney failure in our cats as they get older. We're going to be decreasing a lot of these different issues that are stemming from the high carbohydrate load in dry food, the low uh, humidity and low moisture content of these foods. And I see a lot of patients that are, you know, they're overweight. They don't know how, the owners don't know how to get them to an appropriate weight, but we're still feeding dry food. No matter if dry food is grain-free or not, which obviously we talked about how grain-free is not appropriate, it's still loaded with carbs. And it's not appropriate for these guys. And a lot of animals will have um, vomiting or digestive issues. And this is where it comes to the old, old age old question, why is my dog eating poop or why is my dog eating grass or why is my cat grazing? Well, poop, let's just say it, is the most highly digested thing that one of that an animal can eat. It's already digested. So if they're having digestion problems and they can't digest what you're feeding them, they are going to be eating poop. So it's kind of natural for puppies to want to do that. They're getting um, different probiotics, so they're um, helping out their gut with that. But an older dog should not be doing that. And the reason they're doing that is because they're not fully digesting what you're giving them. So they'll either vomit it back up so it's pre-digested and then eat it again, or they're, they'll defecate or eat someone else's poop because it's more highly digested. Um, that's why our dog species love eating the poop of herbivores, deer, rabbit, um, chickens. You know, they love eating that stuff and it's because it's already pre-digested. It has the grains in it that are pre-digested that they can uh, more appropriately digest. So what I'm getting at is because of an electrician that had nothing to do with pets or animals or science or dog food or anything like that, that moved from the Ohio to the UK in 1860, started off this whole huge trend of dry food. And as, as a people, we've just followed along with it and it's, it's not biologically appropriate. So um, in my book, Dr. Lisa's Animal Anthology, I do have a, a written uh, article about don't scrap the scraps. You know, all right, so when vets get mad at you for feeding table scraps, we're mad at you for feeding pizza crusts and processed foods and french fries and things that we really as a people aren't supposed to be eating either. Um, junk food, you know, if you feed good vegetables that obviously aren't on the, you know, onion list or things that dogs are, you know, prone to having issues with. If you feed good quality meats, good quality grain products, 
those are great. Those are good for dogs. I always suggest people feed green beans or carrots or, you know, um, let's see, what are some other things? I just made treats the other day. I take uh, the um, chicken hearts and chicken livers and I cut them all up and I mix them with turmeric and black pepper, which we already talked about is very anti-inflammatory. And then I dehydrate them and those are good treats. So when our patients are eating poop because they can't digest the dry food that they're on, or they're eating grass because the grass is cooling and the grass is moisturizing and they're trying to get that cooling and that moisture. Think about how you would feel if you were dehydrated and all you were eating was a dry substance, right? Even canned food, it's, it's processed. It's not a huge amount of moisture in it, even though it's a lot more moisture than your dry food. And so they're trying to cool down their stomach. They're trying to trying to get some moisture in their stomach. And a lot of the time what happens is they, they end up getting bad moisture. So if the body doesn't have the correct moisture, it'll start producing bad moisture. And that bad moisture is phlegm. So we get lipomas, the big fatty tumors. We get ear infections, which is called damp heat. We get urinary tract infections. All of that is bad moisture. It's the body saying, I need to produce moisture, but I don't have the right stuff to produce the good moisture. So I'm just going to produce whatever moisture I can. So we get this damp friction and that friction causes heat and it's kind of like canoeing down a river that doesn't have very much water in it and the bottom of your canoe is rubbing along the ground and so you get friction and heat so that's why we have those damp heat problems like the really nasty smelly ears the urinary tract infections that are like really nasty and smelly um the skin infections that are nasty and smelly that's because we started out as dryness usually and then the dryness led to friction and bad moisture, and that led to a damp heat issue. Um, so as a holistic veterinarian, my first goal for any patient is to get them off of dry food. Now, just because we're getting them off of dry food doesn't mean that we need to get them off of commercial made food right now, because nowadays we've got a lot of different great foods that we can use and utilize at our hands that are pre-made, that are almost like home cooked, that are a lot better than the dry, and they're balanced. So we don't have to balance them for you. So one of my favorites is Farmer's Dog. And I hope if Farmer's Dog sees this, hi, sponsor me. Um, so Farmer's Dog will ship it to your house. It's pre-made. It looks like what the farmer would have had left over as their meal and they would have fed the dogs, which is what we were supposed to be feeding these dogs all along. That's why wolves started following along our communities when we were nomadic communities, is we were leaving our scraps behind and they were living off of the scraps. They were not living off of hard tack and dry biscuits. <laughs> so um, farmer's dog's a good one. I like fresh pet select. Uh, the vital version. I like Stella and Chewy's. There's um, uh, Chi Dog. There's a lot of different um, varieties nowadays in the refrigerator section. Now, I'm not saying that you have to go all raw either. Um, some dogs, because they've been raised on kibble or because of how their breed is nowadays, they are not good with raw food. Raw food is a little bit too damp, a little bit too hard to digest for them because we've bred that into them. So some dogs do not do well on it. And like I said, you have to be a responsible raw feeder. So we're not just feeding chicken breasts or chicken meat and a little bit of rice or something. We're feeding whole animals. We're feeding internal organs. We're feeding the offal. We're feeding um, the digestive contents. And so to be a responsible raw feeder, you need to do all of that research. You need to look that up. You need to be prepared. And it can cost money and it can be time consuming, but it's a lot better for our patients in the long run. So if you have any questions about what you need to be feeding your animal or how to get them off of dry food, first of all, I would suggest asking a holistic veterinarian. Unfortunately, nowadays, I was raised as a conventional veterinarian. Um, I was schooled as a conventional veterinarian. So we are raised in the knowledge that dry food is the best and that prescription dry food is the best of the best. And we are raised to look at the back of bags and say, oh, this one has chicken as the first ingredient. You know what? I don't care if it had shoes as the first ingredient. It's 
dried out, ground up in a machine, desiccated, steamed, cooked to death, and it's then dried out again, and then they spray on the nutrients with it. All dry foods are bad. Just saying. And it's not their fault. They were trying to get into a field that would, was already started in the 1860s. And they thought that they were doing well for animals. Well, we also thought that, you know, there's been a whole bunch of diet fads for humans and none of them have worked, right? You know, we haven't figured that out yet, except for, you know, eat whole foods and, and work out and, you know, do your best that way and get sleep. So if you have an issue with that, you probably need to ask a holistic vet because if you ask your conventional vet, they're probably going to look at you like you have three heads. Now, that is one of my goals is to look and try to find conventional veterinarians that are uh, agreeable to learning about this. And so if you have any of your conventional vets, please send them my video. That's how we were raised. That's how we were taught. And so they really don't, for a back, lack of a better term, they don't know any better. Um, but I'm hoping that through my videos, we can talk to people about why dry food is bad and why we need to get them on a more biologically appropriate diet. So feel free to share this with your conventional veterinarian. Hopefully you have a holistic veterinarian near you. Um, I do, when I do appointments, I do do, uh, uh, recipes for my owners if they don't want to do over the counter. Um, but I do have to have a client patient relationship. So I do have to see that animal in person and talk to them. And, um, there are different diets for different dogs, different meats for different dogs, cats, the same way. We're seeing tons of kidney failure and issues in cats. And it's because they've been raised on kibble their whole lives. They're clinically dehydrated. So we need to get those cats on at least at least a canned food that is wet down with some really good high quality bone broth. Um, but it would be better in general if they were on more of a whole food diet as well. Um, yeah, so that's about it. I just wanted to talk to you guys, you know, about the dry food epidemic and I call it an epidemic and, and the fact that it started in 1860 with James Pratt, an electrician selling lightning rods. Thanks.